want to look into the precessing top. And we're going to do it first by making some assumptions that we won't even make clear that we're making to start with. And then we'll make clear that we're making them. And then the next section, the readings for Friday, will be where we do it right with full on principal axes and all of that and re-examine the assumptions that we made. But for now, we want to uh, do a precessing top. Now, this is where if we had had class for real in lecture, I would have brought out the big old bicycle wheel thing and we would have played with it and it would have been a lot of fun. Um, I don't have that. And so bear with me. So first of all, we're going to shake you all over the place. So ah, there you go. Uh, shake you all over the place and move the mouse out of the way. You can see what a disaster everything is. So I have my little top here. See the top? And then I'm going to rotate it, and you'll see, oh my goodness, it's wandering all over the place. Uh, and it, yeah, actually, it's, it would be really fun. Go ahead, make the Lagrangian for this to work out what's going on, because you notice it kind of goes this, it's making this sort of bouncy motion. Almost certainly, it's because this desk is tilted a little that way, and there's gravity, and there's stuff going on, but all right. That's more complicated than we want to deal with right now. So what I really need is a divot, and I don't have a good divot on this desk, I don't think. So I'm going to simulate the divot, just get my cell phone here, and I have this little case thing. This corner will be a place for it to rest it. So let's see if I can make this work right. Yeah, take me a few tries. All right. And so, all right, you see it there. The top is spinning, but it's also precessing. And what do we mean by precession? Precession is when the axis of rotation, when you have something rotating, and the axis of rotation itself rotates, right? It's like a meta rotation. So there's a couple things you notice here. First of all, this, this top spins nice and fast. You see me with my fingers going, whoop, makes it nice and fast. The precession is slow. But as the top slows down, because there is friction here slowing it down, notice that the rate of precession increases. So we're going to want to see if we can model that as well. So that's the physical phenomenon we're talking about. This is also unless you've seen the movie Inception, in case you know what I'm really checking here. And uh, if you don't know what I'm checking, go see the movie Inception. Righto. So uh, we want to analyze this. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to model the top as something much simpler so that it's easier to deal with. So we've got a, uh, a shaft that's this sort of coppery colored thing. It is uh, fixed at the pivot point on the floor, so the point where it hits the brick floor here, that's fixed in place. We're just going to assume it has a frictionless universal joint there, so it can rotate freely without friction around that point. But the um, unlike the top on my desk, it's not going to wander around. That point will stay fixed. Then there's a disk, and I'm going to assume that the shaft is very lightweight, and so all the mass is in the disk, right? And then this disk is going to be rotating, right? Um, well, okay, so if the disk is rotating like that, what that means is that we have an angular momentum vector that is that way, right? Just use your right-hand rule. You can figure out that the omega has to be that way. And because it's rotating, just look at this thing. That's an axis of symmetry, right? Uh, it's got rotational symmetry around the axis represented by the shaft. So you know that that's going to be a principal axis, which means the angular momentum also is going to point along the omega vector there. So the omega vector is also the angular momentum vector. Well, all right. Now, so what we want to do is figure out how is it going to change? And how does angular momentum change? Well, torque, tau, is the rate of change of angular momentum, right? Tau equals dl dt is just the rotational equivalent of F equals dp dt. Um, and what is torque? Well, torque is R cross F. So to do that, well, first of all, what is R in R cross F? R is the displacement from the pivot point to where the force acts. So in this case, the pivot point is going to be, um, we'll use the, the fixed point because that's sort of, I mean, we know that's the point it's going to pivot about. So that's the rational thing to do the calculation about. I'll talk about center of mass later. And then the force, what force is acting? The force is gravity. The gravity acts at the center of mass, right? So there's the force of gravity acts at the center of mass straight down. Um, and so now what you can do is you can use the right hand rule here, right? So the, the R vector looks something like that. You know, it looks like that. So again, I have this weird mirror image thing, so it's hard to do right. R vector looks like that. F is down, so you expect a torque into the page. So if you have a torque into the page, that's the direction of the torque there. Right, so all we've done so far is we started with an omega, um, and now 
and now we're just going to set that aside. We know where the omega is. You can see this little thing spinning. That's the way the omega is. I want to figure out what's the rate of change of omega. Well, that's harder. But rate of change of angular momentum is torque. What torque is on this? Well, about the pivot point, there's actually another force I haven't considered, and that is the force of uh, both whatever force the ground is exerting on the pivot point. That'll include a normal force upwards, because if it wasn't, the whole thing would fall down into the floor. There's also going to be horizontal components of force there, because if there wasn't, the thing would slide around, probably, like it did on my desk. Well, definitely, right, because the center of mass is going to be moving around, and so there's got to be some force to hold it. But those forces do not exert any torque, because they're right at the pivot point. So the lever arm, the R vector for those forces is zero. So we're just going to ignore them. They don't exert any torque. They're not going to change the angular momentum about this pivot point. So we figured out the torque is R cross F. That's this tau vector here. So what do we do with this? Well, remember, tau is dl dt, and l is in the same direction as omega. I haven't actually labeled an l vector here, but you notice that omega is that way. You can just tell from how it's spinning. So let's just go zoom down onto the origin here so that we can just see these two guys a little better. That's omega. That's tau. Well, if tau is the rate of change of omega, and notice tau is perpendicular to omega, so it's not going to change the length of omega. It's only going to change its direction. And if you look at the way it's going, tau is going to cause omega to go around in a circle like this, right? That's the, the rate. If the rate of change of omega is perpendicular to omega, well, the tip rotates it around in a circle, right? So it, it's oh, the omega vector sweeps out this cone, it looks like. Um, really, it's just circular motion. If I took the component of omega in the xy plane, that would be the radius of a circle. It's the radius of the circle in omega space that is being traced out. Now, once again, remember, really tau is dl dt, and I'm, I'm relying on the fact, which turns out not exactly to be a fact, but we'll come back to that, relying on the fact that L is in the same direction as omega here. So just given that tau, just the vector math tells you tau is d omega dt, omega is going to have to rotate around like that. How does that translate to the motion of the top? Well. Omega, we've already argued, and again, there's something under the rug that I'll come back to. We've already argued that the omega of the top points along the shaft, right? Because this the, the disk is spinning nice and fast, and so that's where all the angular momentum is. Um, so if omega points along the shaft and omega is rotating, the shaft must be rotating. And so if we zoom this all the way back out, um, you can see that's what happens here, right? So I've got the, the tau and omega vector still pointing in the same direction. And the uh, omega, for omega to change the way it does, this whole top has to process the way it does. And you'll notice it keeps tau pointing in exactly the right direction for this circular motion, right? Because r is changing, f is always downward, so the direction of f doesn't change, but that displacement always changes. So that's what the processing top looks like. So, so far, what we've done is we've made the argument um, that you should expect this to happen um, based on just the directions of the torque and the directions of the rate of change of angular momentum. Now, here's let's lift that rug up and look at the, some of the, the dirt we've brushed under the rug. When I first started, I just had the disk rotating and nothing else. And so very clearly, omega was along the, the axis of rotation there because it was a principal axis. But now I get back to this thing and I have the whole thing processing around. You should object, wait a minute, the angular momentum isn't all just because of the disk rotating, but that whole thing rotating as well is additional rotational moment, uh, motion. Shouldn't that contribute to the overall omega vector? And the answer is yes. Yes, it should. So we have made the assumption, and Taylor makes this assumption, that whatever additional omega you have as a result of that precession is small compared to the rotation due to just the, the initial rotation of the disk. Mathematically, how do you say that? Well, he works in the frame of reference of the body. Why? So that we can be dealing with the principal axes of the body. So the omega, as shown in this image here, omega is along the shaft. That is what he calls um, unit vector E3. So that's one of the three principal axes. The other two are going to be perpendicular to it. And then he says, well, let's make the assumption that the omega along E3 and the angular momentum along E3, both of them, are much larger than the omegas and angular momentum along 
E1 and E2 along the two perpendicular directions. Now that's in the rotating frame. And the global frame, what that's saying is that, well, we're making the assumption that the omega is along the shaft, because that is the direction of E3. It's which direction it is, is changing in time. But we're assuming that the components of omega perpendicular to the shaft are very small compared to the component of omega along the shaft. And if you just look at it, in fact, this is one of the things when we looked at the top at the beginning, the top was spinning really fast. The procession was slow. And so it's reasonable then to say, well, okay, if the top's spinning really fast and all the other rotational motion is slow, that most of the angular momentum is along the shaft, right? So just looking at it, it seems reasonable. In the next section, he will more quantitatively justify that. All right, so that's the direction of it. Can we figure out the magnitude? So what we want to do next is see, can we work out the rate of precession and then use that to check the assumptions that we had earlier? So... Here we go. We have our, our ground here, and then here's the shaft, and here's the disk, and I'm going to define some quantities here. Let's go ahead and define capital R as the distance from the ground to the shaft, and I'm going to define, I know this is different from what was on the video, but there's reasons for it. Lowercase r is the radius of the disk. Um, I'm going to call this angle here theta. So we know that omega, I'm drawing my vector all thick here, omega is in that direction, because uh, we said that before, right? And then that angle there is also theta. Um, we have gravity acting at the center of mass, so Fg. And I'm going to just say that's Mg, where M is the mass of the disk. We're assuming the shaft is extremely light, so it has no mass. We know that the moment of inertia of a disk rotating around its axis is one half m r squared, where that's the lowercase r. In this case, that's what Taylor would have called lambda sub three, assuming E three is the axis that's the symmetry axis of this body. And since it is rotating around a primary axis, um, at least initially, right before we consider, before we, before it starts processing, which is kind of an odd way to say it, but whatever, that's true. But that's only true because it's. Um, rotating around a primary axis. We have that. And in fact, let's go ahead and define some axes. Let's define x that way, z that way, and y into the page. Um, so I could actually write omega vector as omega cosine theta x hat plus omega sine theta z hat, right? It's got x and z components, if it's something like that. All right, that's omega. Now the torque that we have on this guy, the torque is just going to be r cross f, where r vector is the vector from the displacement to the force, right? And so now remember, I'm going to change colors briefly here, remember that the magnitude of a torque is the magnitude of r times the magnitude of f, which is mg, times the sine of the angle between r and f, well that's this angle. So that's actually 90 degrees minus theta. And sine pi over 2 minus theta is just cosine theta. So that's Rmg cosine theta. And then the direction of torque, you could just use your um, right hand to figure out that this is in the plus y hat direction. It's into the page. Now, the other way I could have done this is I could have written, let's do yet another color. I could have written R. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. I could have written r is equal to, r vector is equal to r cosine theta x hat plus r sine theta z hat. And f is equal to minus mg z hat, right? It's just its direction. So if I write out r cross f, I'm going to have... Um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and distribute a priori. I have minus mgr cosine theta times x hat cross z hat minus mgr cosine theta z hat cross z hat. Right? I just distributed the cross product. Well, z hat cross z hat is 0. x hat cross z hat is minus y hat. I get exactly the same thing. Hey, hooray, mgr cosine theta in the plus y hat direction because the two minuses 
multiply each other out. So that's the torque that we have. So let me clean myself up a little bit here. All right, so given that torque, what can we do with it? Well, you know that torque is just dl dt, and we are going to go ahead here and um, just assume that that's uh, i d omega dt, once again, assuming that we are just rotating around a principal axis, but you have to be a little careful with that. I know. Maybe I don't want that. I don't know. We'll find out. Okay, now. How do we actually figure out? Well, we figured out what the torque is, so we need to connect that to dl dt, and somehow we need to connect that to the precession. How the heck are we going to do that? Well, here's one way you could do it, is that now that we, I mean, you go ahead and use this thing that I've crossed out, and you have omega that's in this direction, and you have the torque, which is into the page, right? And if I take, if actually, if I divide omega by i, it is now l, it's going to make a circle like that, I could use the radius of this circle by taking a component of omega and use uh, an equivalent to the acceleration as v squared over r. So um, uh, in order to figure out how this all works out, I'm not actually, hmm, I haven't thought this all the way through, but you can do a thing like that. Um, it's not actually really acceleration, of course, but we have a, ooh, we have a better way to do it. And that better way comes from chapter nine. So here's what we're going to do from chapter nine. We are going to use the very useful relationship from chapter nine. That was the thing with all the cues in it. And this very useful relationship um, tells us that, and I'll, instead of Q, we'll do it with L because that's the one we care about. DL DT, that is in the inertial frame. And that's the one we ultimately want, right? Because we're, we want to see how does this top process around in the inertial frame. DL DT is equal to dl prime dt, where that is dl dt in the rotating frame, plus omega cross l, where omega is the rotation of the rotating frame relative to the inertial frame. So this is a general thing for, for going taking a derivative in a inertial frame going to a rotating frame. Well, what's the rotating frame we want to use? Well, so first of all, here's the z-axis. Let's do the rotating frame that is processing with this object. Right? And so we know from the, the arguments we made before that it's going to omega around like that. In the rotating frame that processes with the object, in that rotating frame, the object is always pointing in the same direction, right? Because the axes are rotating with the object. And since the object's always pointing in the same direction, its angular momentum is always pointing in the same direction. That means dl by dt is zero in the rotating frame, right? It's along that E3 axis, which is the one that's tilted up in the same direction as omega, right? E3, the unit vector would be that way. It's always along that axis. So in the rotating frame, it's that. So we know in the non-rotating frame, dl dt has to equal omega cross L. All right, and so we can use that. Notice that omega is entirely in the Z direction, right? Um, so I could say, write omega is omega Z hat cross, and now for L, I'm going to write it as I, and I'm actually going to write out I because it's a disk, is one half M R squared um, omega. And then it's got a um, cosine theta X hat plus sine theta Y hat, right? That thing in parentheses is L vector because I multiplied the moment of inertia by omega. Right, and that's the vector form of omega. So go ahead and distribute this out. You'll notice that I have a, first of all, I did it wrong because this y hat here should have been a z hat. Why didn't you say anything? Maybe you did. I just didn't hear because this is pre-recorded, right? Because that was z hat y because it was z hat up here. Okay, so you'll notice when I do this cross product, the second term is going to have a z hat cross z hat. So that's going to go away. So I'm going to have left is a z hat cross x hat. Z hat cross x hat is y hat. So omega cross L is going to equal, um, just write one half m r squared um, capital omega, lowercase omega, um, cosine theta, z hat cross x hat is y hat, right? That is omega cross L. That's from the right side. All I did is I figured out omega. I know it's going to be in the z direction. 
Um, and so I'll just write it. We want to, we figured that out before we made the argument out the direction before we want to find the magnitude omega. So that's the thing we're looking for now. Um, and take this out just to make space, put the zero, oops, uh, put the zero up there. DLDT, of course, is just the torque. So that's going to be R M G cosine theta y hat. So if you look at this, notice I have a thing y hat and a thing y hat. So it's a y component equals a y component. They have to equal each other. Um, so I, and I can divide both sides by cosine theta. That's sort of interesting, right? The precession rate does not depend on the angle. Maybe that's surprising. And now I can just solve this for omega. So I'm going to clear some stuff out above to give myself space. What I end up with solving this for omega is that capital omega, that's the rate of precession is equal to, can I, can I actually do this right? Notice how the M's cancel as well. I'm going to have a 2GR divided by R squared lowercase omega, right? That is the precession rate. All right, so let's think about this for a little bit. Is this what we expected? Uh -uh. Well, one thing... Remember, we made the observation looking at the little video of the top in the first place, that as omega went up, as the spin rate of the top went up, the precession rate went down. And you see that here. The faster the top is spinning, the lower the precession rate. Huh, well, that's interesting, too. Um, stronger gravity, stronger precession. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you'd expect that. But we do see that relationship that we were looking for before. Now, I should know so this is also exactly the same as what Taylor has. I think it's uh, Taylor's 10.83, except that he has lambda 3, and I have substituted in 1 half m little r squared for lambda 3. Um, so that'll add an m back in. Anyway, it's exactly the same as what he had. It's just in the specific case of the disk. So that's how you would work out what is that omega. Now, let's go back and review this assumption that... All right, so we've made the assumption that the angular momentum is entirely along the E3 axis. But now you know also there is some rotation as a result of the precession. How do you compare the angular momentum of the two? Here's how I want to do it. Um, I want to think about, and I'm going to actually look down on this top from above, right? So if here's the axis, and so omega goes, is, that's the omega vector. The top, right, it's elongated because we're looking at it edge on. Um, so your omega vector is sort of sticking out of the page at an angle like that. Um, and then the whole thing is going around like that, right? That's the omega. You could think about this as an orbital angular momentum, right? So we can have an L orb, which is just going to be, um, I need a new R. I'm going to use fancy R just because I've run out of other R. So fancy R here is just that. What is fancy R? Um, and it's not a vector. Well, yes, it is a vector. The length of fancy R is just going to be, um, I'm trying to revisualize it. I think it's just going to be R sine theta, given how I defined theta. It's R cosine theta, given how I defined theta. I'm try I don't have the picture in front of me anymore, and so I'm trying to visualize what it was. I hope it's R cosine theta. Go back and look at the picture. Um, tell me if I did it right. Um, good. So it's R cosine theta, right? That's that's what fancy R is. L or orb is just R cross P of the center of mass. And what is P of the center of mass? Well, if you look at the way I rotated my axes, Z is out of the board now. That's X. And that's Y. Um, so R is just R cosine theta X hat, right? Um, and that is going to be crossed with... Um, my brain just died on me. That's going to be crossed with M V C M Y hat. And what is V C M? Uh, well, V C M is just going to be capital Omega R curly, right? Because it's just going around in a circle like that. So the result of this, so X hat cross Y hat is going to be Z hat L orb, the orbital angular momentum. We're going to have an M we are going to have a, um, there's going to be 
an R squared because you have one R from here and one R that's inside VCM. And then you have omega, so let's put in the rest of omega, 2G capital R um, divided by R squared, little R squared omega times cosine theta. All right, that is the orbital angular momentum. It's in the Z direction. The assumption we made was that this orbital angular momentum was really small, L orb, was really small compared to the spin angular momentum. And so what that really says is that 2g m r cubed over r squared omega cosine theta, right? So that's the orbital, has to be a lot less than 1 half m r squared omega, right? That is the condition that is the assumption that we were making. Does it apply? I don't know, right? So you have to you have to look at this and think about it. Well, one thing that's clear is that the bigger omega gets, the lowercase omega here, right? The bigger that gets, the easier this is to satisfy. In fact, let's multiply both sides by omega. So that gets rid of that one. This becomes omega squared, right? So there, clearly, um, the bigger omega, uh, the easier that is to happen. Uh, here's another thing. Let's multiply both sides by r squared. Get that out of the denominator. I guess I actually can erase here. Oops. Getting that out of the denominator, and that squared will become a to the fourth. So, um, and then I can divide m from both sides. So, r to the fourth omega squared, how does that compare to gr cubed cosine theta? But then there's a factor of four, right? Because there's two on one side, a half on the other. That's what's going to decide. So, um, all right. So for a given geometry, big, really big lowercase omega means this assumption applies. Now, think back. In fact, look back when we were looking at the original um, top and notice that as it slows down, right? So there is friction slowing down the lowercase omega. Eventually, the procession is no longer a nice wobbling procession, but or nice smooth procession. But it starts to wobble over the place and eventually falls down. Once the spin rate gets low enough that our assumptions of, that the angular momentum is basically entirely along the symmetry axis, um, that we made that assumption in order to drive the precession rate. Once that assumption is not as good, our derivation is no longer good. And so the results aren't going to be good. And you can see actually things kind of go to hell. All right. So that is what I have to say about the precession of a top. We will revisit this. Um, and the reading for Friday, we actually come up with real differential equations for the rate of change of omega. Now, they're not as satisfying as you might want because they're going to be in the accelerated reference frame of the body, um, which is a little weird. Um, so it's not, it would be nice if we could just have them in the inertial frame, but it turns out that um, that becomes a mess for reasons that we'll talk about later. So do the reading for Friday. I will probably record things for Friday. I think I'm done recording for today, but based on the questions I get, it's possible I'll record something tomorrow afternoon. I'm recording this Tuesday. Surprise. Um, good night. Except it's whenever you watch this, good morning, good afternoon, good midnight.